Stephen Gallagher from CUHK Law and this is Class Acts. I'd like to talk to you about Chinese shipwrecks and the law of treasure hunting. And I just wanted to start by saying it's often been said that the first boat that was ever launched probably sank. But what's not often said is that, that people probably tried to save that boat. And if there was something of value on it, they probably tried to recover that as well. And humankind has always tried to recover things of value from the oceans. Now, when we think of recovering things of value from shipwrecks, we obviously think about things like gold and silver and jewels. And we think about pirate treasure. But of course, the true treasure of our oceans lies in our heritage and our history, which is at the bottom of the oceans. So this image is a photograph of a wreck that was discovered in 2018 at the bottom of the Black Sea. It's the oldest intact shipwreck ever discovered, 2,400 years old, and of course its value is in all the information it gives us about shipbuilding techniques, life aboard ship, what was carried on the ships, the trade between different peoples at that time. That's the true heritage of the oceans. But let's focus on some gold and silver as well, because at the bottom of the oceans we also have some incredible shipwrecks that do contain, or probably do contain, gold and silver and other treasures. So this is a painting of a very famous battle that took place between the Spanish and the English back at the beginning of the 1700s, in which this ship, the San Jose, exploded. It seems that a shell hit its magazine and the gunpowder exploded and the boat sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Now what's not often remembered about this ship is that 600 people were aboard at the time, so 600 lives were lost. And that's another issue to do with these shipwrecks and people trying to recover wrecks and treasure. But this shipwreck is a legendary shipwreck, mostly because of what cargo it's meant to contain. And when its wreck was discovered and has been uh, mapped out more recently, the issues have arisen as to whether it still contains the gold, the silver, the emeralds that were meant to be on board at the time it was sank, perhaps worth 17 billion US dollars in today's money. That's why it's described as the holy grail of shipwrecks. But of course, the issue arises with this particular shipwreck. If the gold, the silver, the jewels are ever recovered, who do they belong to? Because it was a Spanish ship, but it was bringing back treasures from the South Americas, from Peru. It sank in waters that are today claimed by Colombia. And it was discovered, well, originally by a private company who say they have a license from the Colombian government, but subsequently by a private company working with a, a public company from North America, from the United States. So suddenly there becomes an issue about if this treasure is recovered, who owns it? And that's really what I want to talk to you about today. So I want to talk to you about who owns shipwreck and treasure when it's discovered. If you find it, can you keep it? And what part does Chinese shipwrecks play in the development of the law to do with the ownership of shipwreck? So let's start off by considering the law and why it's important in Asia. This is a map of known shipwreck sites mapped out as small black dots. Each black dot represents a known shipwreck site. And here I've frozen the map on our region, on the Asia-Pacific region, and we can see that there are thousands of dots there. Each dot represents a shipwreck. Each shipwreck may contain treasure. And so that's why it's important to know about who owns shipwrecks, particularly in Asian waters. The law itself about the ownership of shipwreck and the treasures on board has traditionally been the law of salvage. And the law of salvage is one of the oldest private international laws, a law that worked between individuals from different nations based upon maritime merchant law. And in its original form, it was quite simple. The idea was that the law of salvage was intended to help encourage people to save ships and to save goods upon shipwrecked ships for the original owners. And this was to be without taking any of the goods for yourself, but you would be entitled to a reward 
for saving the ship or the goods for the original owners. So the law of salvage operates in roughly the same way today. Generally, any shipwreck discovered, any cargo recovered, should be saved for the original owner. But it becomes more interesting, of course, when we say, what happens if you can't find the original owner? Or what happens if the original owner has abandoned the wreck or the goods? Well, at that point, most jurisdictions, most states around the world have now introduced laws which say, in those circumstances, the wreck, the cargo, it belongs to the state in whose waters it's found. And the finder, well, they may be given a reward or they will be given a reward, but they might be in entitled to keep some of the, the recovered cargo as well, or a share of any profits from the cargo. But on the high seas, outside of jurisdictional waters, if we can't identify wreck, if the wreck has been abandoned, then the finder may be able to keep this. And that was a concern to many states about wrecks in international waters and about them being exploited by treasure hunters. But, but most people were saying, well, it's not really a problem because we're talking about the deep oceans. And really, no one has the technology to exploit the deep oceans. And if they do, it's going to be expensive and that's going to put treasure hunters off. Well, as technology developed, things changed. This was never really a problem until we get to 1945 and the development of the Aqualung, the self-contained underwater breathing apparatus by Jacques Cousteau, which allowed for many people to explore the oceans relatively safely and relatively cheaply. And that led to a boom in the treasure hunting industry. And we got such famous characters as Mel Fisher in North America, who went hunting for the fabled treasure ships from the Spanish fleets that were exploiting all of the wealth from South America, and he found some of them. And when he did, of course, he recovered the treasures from them, and there were legal disputes about the ownership. Because, of course, the Spanish would often say, this treasure has come from one of our ships, so that should be our treasure. And then others would come in and say, yes, but the, the treasure originally came from our state, so we should have a share in this treasure as well. But the American courts, at times awarded ownership of these wrecks and their treasure to treasure hunters like Mel Fisher, which led to concern from the international community. It led to changes in the law in North America as well to close this loophole so that people like Mel Fisher couldn't exploit wrecks anymore. And it led to the international community starting to think about what would happen if people did discover shipwrecks at the bottom of the ocean and try to recover from them. So the international community's response was to add a couple of provisions. Really, not hard laws, but just indications of intent to an international convention, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, this was promulgated in 1982 and has been described as a constitution for the oceans. So it's really about the use of the oceans, the free use of the oceans, and also about ownership of the oceans and control of different parts of the oceans, particularly what are referred to as territorial waters. But the general idea is that the, the high seas and the seabed should be at the, at the free use of everyone, with the seabed being protected from exploitation. And of course, that's where our shipwrecks are usually found. So with the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the international community, starting to think about these shipwrecks, added two provisions which were to do with shipwrecks found on the high seas, on the seabed, and just said that really these should be protected for all of humankind. These aren't hard laws, but indications that they should be protected. Now the international community's response was considered adequate at the time, because, as I said, no one really thought that there'd ever be a danger to these shipwrecks. But then a problem occurred, and that was to do with this particular ship. And many of you may recognise this image. It's a painting of a very famous shipwreck. This is a shipwreck of the Titanic. The Titanic having struck an iceberg and then sinking. And we can see all of these people in the ocean around the, the sinking ship. Because, of course, it was carrying thousands of people, and in the end, hundreds of people died. So a 
terrible tragedy. Now, the wreck of the Titanic was thought to lie somewhere at the bottom of the North Atlantic. And people weren't really worried about it ever being discovered or ever being disturbed because it would be so deep. And the technology was not thought to be advanced enough to actually find it. But of course, in 1985, the wreck of the Titanic was discovered at a depth of some, well, 3,700 metres. So that's nearly four kilometres, about two miles deep. And not only was it discovered, it was filmed and items were recovered from it. And of course, that made the international community start to think that perhaps we need to do something, an international response, to protect such wrecks. At the same time, because of the tightening up of laws in jurisdictions like the Americas and in Europe, treasure hunting activities shifted their focus. They shifted away from the Americas and Europe and moved across to Asia. And that's why we have to now consider Chinese shipwrecks and their part in the development of the law, particularly domestic laws around Asia and also, of course, international laws as well. The treasure hunters, looking elsewhere for their gold and silver, came to Asia and found shipwrecks. And they did find gold and silver, but they found another form of treasure as well. And that's been described as blue and white gold because they found the great porcelain treasures. They found shipwrecks which had intact cargoes of porcelain, and we're talking primarily Chinese porcelain. In 1984, Mike Hatcher dis uh, discovered what's been called the Hatcher Cargo, 25,000 pieces of porcelain from the Ming Dynasty in remarkably well-preserved condition, which were then sold off at auction by his company. In 1985, he found the Nanking Cargo, 150,000 pieces of blue and white porcelain. And probably one of his most famous discoveries was that in 1999, when he discovered the wreck of the Tek Singh. From this, he recovered some 360,000 items, and again, these were sold off at auctions. The importance of these wrecks, the importance that's often overlooked, but we know more about with regard to the Tek Singh, is of course the human tragedy that's associated with these wrecks. For the Tek Singh, it's a relatively recent wreck. It only sank about 200 years ago, and we have quite a lot of records about the sinking, and even about those who may have been aboard. Because about 1,800 people were on board the Tek Singh when it sank, and 1,600 lives were lost. That's why it's sometimes been described as China's Titanic. The selling off of this porcelain by Mike Hatcher and by others attracted a lot of attention from China. And China's response was promoted by, well, there is a story that Chinese officials contacted Mike Hatcher when he discovered the Nanking cargo, when they heard it was to be sold off at auction. And they asked him that because this was a wreck containing Chinese porcelain, would he give them some of the Chinese porcelain for their museums? And Mike Hatcher's response was, well, you can go to Amsterdam you can go to the auctions and you can buy it for yourself. Now that's the story, and the story continues that the Chinese officials went to Amsterdam and tried to buy things at the auction, but they didn't have enough money to actually buy any of this porcelain and take it back to China. Because China, of course, wasn't the economic powerhouse that it is today. And that, of course, infuriated the Chinese. And the Chinese government's response was to bring into force probably the strictest laws protecting underwater cultural heritage or underwater cultural relics, as they described it, anywhere in the world. And also to promote a policy of celebrating their underwater cultural heritage. So in 1989, we get regulations to do with the protection of underwater cultural relics. These are based upon the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. They use the jurisdiction that are identified there but they are more far-reaching than possibly any other laws for any other nation. These laws assert ownership over any shipwrecks in Chinese waters, whether or not they are Chinese. And they also purport to assert 
ownership over shipwrecks found in international waters as well. So, an assertion and probably an indication of intention on the part of the Chinese government. Apart from the new laws, China adopted a new policy and invested heavily in trying to identify and protect its underwater cultural heritage and celebrate it as well. And probably the most famous case of this is the wreck of the Nanhai No. 1, a 1,000-year-old shipwreck which possibly contains 80,000 items found at the bottom of the ocean. And China took the, the remarkable step of deciding not to excavate these items from the wreck on the seabed, but to actually just take the seabed and raise the whole seabed and bring it to land, drag it up onto land, and then build a museum around that, and then excavate the relics underwater in the museum. A huge task, a colossal expenditure, and a sign of the commitment that China's got to its underwater cultural heritage today. The museum, the Maritime Silk Route Museum, becomes the first point on a maritime silk route that China is trying to map out at present to indicate its long seafaring traditions and its long trading history with many nations around the world. And that's why it's celebrating things like the Ming voyages and trying to establish archaeological sites that celebrate the fact of these famous voyages around the world to show the connection that China's always had with these nations around the Indian subcontinent, Arabia, and down the coast of Africa as well. There are economic and political reasons behind this, but it's also a celebration of China's cultural heritage. The international community, spurred on by concerns about wrecks like the Titanic and the exploits that were going on in Asia with the Chinese porcelain wrecks, did bring in new laws in 2001. And this is the Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. So we have a new international convention. And this does have hard laws in it which are intended to protect our underwater cultural heritage. And the first principle is that the underwater cultural heritage should be protected for all of us because it is part of humankind's heritage. And it should never be exploited. And that means that salvage is incompatible with the provisions of the convention. So, very important laws which will protect our underwater cultural heritage if nations sign up to them. And of course that's been the biggest problem because we have the laws there but not many nations have actually signed up to this particular convention. And that means when we consider the question of who owns shipwreck today, well, if we look at the laws that apply, this table shows you um, three international conventions. On the far right, we have our Underwater Cultural Heritage Convention from 2001, and I've put down there a list of Asian jurisdictions. Uh, and at the bottom, we'll see a list of jurisdictions of the traditional seafaring nations, Germany, Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, United Kingdom, United States of America. And we can see that not many of them have signed up to the convention, and if we look at the local Asian regions, only Cambodia has signed up to the convention. There's always been talk of China signing up to the convention, but it may be that its laws are incompatible with the provisions of the convention. So, we have that new international law, not many people have signed up to it. In fact, more people have signed up to the salvage conventions, and nearly everyone, with the exception of the United States, has signed up to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And that means that when we have to start thinking about who owns the oceans and shipwrecks found in them, we have to think about the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and its effect on jurisdictions. So if we put up a map of our region and the South China Sea, which of course has lots of people are contesting ownership in that region, well, we can see why. Because this is the overlay of the jurisdiction of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And we see these hatched areas, the diagonal lines, these are disputed areas. And we see that shipwrecks found in these areas, well, there will be disputes over their ownership and they will not be protected by the new international convention. So if you're thinking, okay, but what happens in Hong Kong? And if you're thinking perhaps you want to go and look for treasure in Hong Kong's waters, well then please remember this. 
Hong Kong's laws are pretty settled. Hong Kong has a three-mile jurisdictional limit inside China's waters. And within those waters, if you find shipwreck, if you find treasure, then the law is pretty straightforward. If you find anything that predates the year 1800, then it belongs to the Hong Kong SAR. It belongs to all of us. If you find anything after 1800, well then, it still belongs to the original owner of the property, if they can be traced, and if not, it belongs to the Hong Kong SAR. Now, if you do find something, please don't take it. Please notify officials, probably the Hong Kong Maritime Museum. It's a great museum, and they coordinate things to do with this. And you may be entitled to a reward, but please don't take it. Thank you very much, and now I'll take some questions. Okay, I've got a first question up. If the finders can keep the treasures they found at sea, can the pirates sink a ship, then find the wrecked ship later and claim ownership of the treasures? Well, first of all, they shouldn't sink any ships, of course. You know, piracy is one of those few crimes that the international community agree on. It is a crime. Uh, so, no, they shouldn't be sinking any ships. And, of course, we've already said that if a ship is sunk today, then the original owners of the ship of the cargo on board remain the owners and if someone does recover that ship or the cargo, well, then they'll be entitled to a reward, but they can't keep the property. Second question. As you mentioned in the talk, the treasure found in the shipwrecks are also historical heritage. What can governments do to rescue their underwater cultural heritage if the relating laws are not yet in place? Well, that's one of the big issues. I mean, most jurisdictions, particularly in Asia now, have laws which are intended to protect their underwater cultural heritage. So in Hong Kong, we have our Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance, which applies to the land and to heritage found uh, underwater as well. Um, but the big problem we have in Asia is in many of these jurisdictions, even if there are laws, they're not enforced. Um, and that's where we had... Uh, issues in the last 20 years in Asian waters. So uh, the thing to do, of course, is to encourage these states to try and enforce their laws and to encourage states to sign up to the International Convention so that we get underwater cultural heritage protected for all of us. The next question is, Hong Kong used to be a famous seaport, and what has the Hong Kong government done to protect the underwater cultural heritage? Uh, well, we have got laws which protect underwater cultural heritage. Um, as I said to you before, it's the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance. And um, that is enforced in our waters. Uh, but the Hong Kong government could do more. Uh, the Hong Kong Maritime Museum, if you go to their website, they have a plan for actually mapping out all of our underwater cultural heritage in, in Hong Kong's waters. And identifying it is the first step in protecting our underwater cultural heritage. So that would be something that I would hope the Hong Kong government would do. Our last question is, do we need to recite lots of legal provisions if we study law? Um, well, yes, I'm afraid you have to learn a bit of law. Um, we tend not to recite legal provisions, but actually in the study of law, you do start to just remember certain of these principles. Uh, particularly in a common law jurisdiction like Hong Kong, you tend to remember the stories associated with cases. So you remember the cases and you find yourself actually knowing what the law is. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining me today. In the next episode of Class Acts, Professor Ian Morley will talk about city development and urban history. So thank you once again. <laughs>